What's going on guys? Welcome back to 4K Motoring. I'm Chris and behind me is my 2022 Ducati Multistrada V4S. So I wanted to take a moment and address one of the recent videos I did, a link up here, with my 2015 Multistrada 1200S and some of the concerns I mentioned upgrading to the new V4 model. Now I've had this bike for about a month. I've put just shy of a thousand miles on it. I've made it past its initial service window and I can use the full RPM range at this point. So I wanted to tell you a little bit about just how I'm feeling with the upgrade, if it was worth it, and of those concerns I mentioned, how I really feel about them. Now the first issue I mentioned in that video is with the front end of the bike, namely this 19 inch front wheel. Now, as you know, the old Multistrada had a 17 inch front, was very agile, handling felt very sharp, may have been a little bit unstable at speed, but otherwise was a very good handling bike. I mean, you just, you thought about it and the bike knew where you were going before you did. It was pretty awesome. When it comes to this bike, it now has a 19 inch front wheel. Now it does give us a little edge for off-roading. It's a little bit taller, provides a little bit better ground clearance, better rollover really better for this adventure touring, which Multistrada is ultimately supposed to be. As far as handling goes, here is my takeaway from the upgraded wheel size. I was very concerned that the 19 inch front wheel would handle like other 19 inch front bikes, namely the KTM Super Adventure or some of the BMW GS series that really felt kind of like whales. They just handled very slow and were very big bikes. It was really hard to get that same feeling the old Multistrada had. With this 19 inch, I don't feel like it's gone that far. If you guys have ridden the 1260 Multistrada as opposed to the old 1200, you know they changed some of the frame geometry to make it a little bit more stable at speed, and thus the handling was a little bit dulled in low speed maneuvers. I feel like this 19 inch front on this V4 with whatever geometry they've gone with has basically the same feeling as that 1260 did. It's not quite as sharp as the old 1200 Multistrada, my 2015 and even before. Now the bike is wearing the same 120, 70 Z rated tire, obviously around a 19 inch front instead of a 17. So overall the grip and the road profile is about the same on the tire. One of the concerns I mentioned from the old video was that there's less sticky rubber available for the 19 inch front and that concerned me a little bit. I say only a little bit because I kept these Scorpion Trail 2s on my 2015 Multistrada throughout the entire time I had it. Honestly, I'm very impressed with them. They handle temperature ranges very well from cold to summer weather. They handle rain very well. They handle the dry very well. They corner well. I mean, really all around, I haven't had any issues with these tires. They're a little bit expensive and I could probably find now the new Road 6 or something like that would be a reasonable tire for this bike. I've just never tried them on it. I know these work. And honestly, with this 19 inch front, if that's what I keep, then I have no concerns with that. Probably even a bigger notable change from the old 17 inch wheel is with regards to the braking on the front end. Now, the rotors are the same size as the old bike, 330 mil rotors, which if you watch MotoGP, they run 320 or 340, depending on wet or dry weather but we're right in between those, really no complaints there. The front caliper, our Brembo Stylema calipers, they're a variation of the M50s that were on the old bike. These are the latest and greatest from Brembo. Pretty awesome setup. It's full Brembo top to bottom. The equipment provided is really good. The problem is now we have a little bit bigger wheel, so the torque that the brakes are allowed to put on the wheel, vice versa, is not quite as sharp. Now the braking on this bike is still very good. So don't make any mistake about that. It handles and it brakes very well. But when you notice that front end, front lever feel, it doesn't bite quite as hard. And that is definitely something that you notice while riding it. Something I think might help if you guys have followed along with the Pikes Peak announcement for the new 2022 Pikes Peak and beyond, that bike is going to have the same brake setup on the front, obviously with a 17 inch wheel, but it's gonna use the same brake pads as the Panigale, which apparently are a little bit stickier, a little bit more aggressive compound than the one they use on this Multistrada. This is probably better for long-term, less wear, that sort of thing. But 
I might be switching to those Panigale pads just to get that little extra front end bite out of this tire that I'm used to on my old bike. One of the next things I mentioned on that last video was with the change from a single side swing arm to this double sided unit from Ducati. I understand why they did it. This is both lighter and stiffer than the old single sided was. So as far as performance goes, this is definitely a better swing arm to have. In relation to the rear wheel, this also works better with spoked wheels, which are available with this bike. And for the off-road oriented, or at least off-road capability that this bike is maintaining that it has, I get that and I don't have a problem with it. The rear end as well doesn't need special tools to adjust the chain or change the tire which means if you're traveling, if you're doing those long distance touring things like this bike is supposedly capable of, it's much easier to find the tools, find the shops, etc., that are able to change this or to be able to change this. So I have no problems with that. I think it's the right decision. I think they have done a pretty good job designing it for a double-sided swing arm. It doesn't look bad at all. That said, the single-sided was just cool, and for the European bikes, I think it makes them stand out just a little bit more. Sticking with the back of the bike, the new rear tire is on a four and a half inch wheel instead of the old six inch wheel the old bike used to have. And again, I'm not talking about the Pikes Peak because the Pikes Peak is sticking with a single side swing arm and that six inch wheel. But for this four inch wheel, I was a bit concerned because in theory, this bike is putting out more power. It's about the same, maybe just a little bit more, but our wheel and our contact patch is getting smaller. And that's something that worried me a little bit. In looking at most other adventure bikes, they're all running this size. We went from a 190 section tire to a 170. So 20 mils narrower, and that's mostly out of the contact patch in the center. I'll tell you, in riding it so far, I really haven't noticed an issue. The power seems to be just fine with this tire. It seems to be hooking up well, and the cornering actually seems a little bit more lively with it. So overall, I'm not too upset about that. The bike has really neutral handling, and it really does feel good, especially at low speeds. It doesn't lumber around, and for somebody that's doing off-road or something like that, the handling is pretty good. When it comes to the new engine, specifically, this bike has a phenomenal power plant. This V4 is definitely an improvement from the old L-Twin. I will say the L-Twin had a bit more character, though, that seems to be lost in this new motor. It is incredibly smooth all the way through the RPM range, which is a little bit disappointing, to be honest. That old L-Twin kind of had a, a feeling, a soul, something that you kind of had to learn a little bit. Once you learn that engine, you could kind of master the output from it. This just makes it super easy. It makes it so anybody can get on and ride it. The power is definitely there. Right from the bottom, it is nice and smooth, and about midway through the rev range, it picks up and this bike will fly. The quick shifter that comes with the S model, Man, let me tell you, it is super smooth up and down. Makes this bike an absolute rocket ship. Although we no longer have the DVT system, the electronics on this new motor are pretty good. The rear cylinder deactivation they have in this bike is a really cool feature. When the bike is up to temperature, every time you pull on the clutch and the bike comes down to idle, you can hear it shut off this rear bank of cylinders. That really helps to save a good bit of fuel, as this bike is not known for its fuel mileage. It does do a pretty good job of keeping heat away from the rider, which Ducati has gone through a lot of effort and a lot of time to try and make happen. Speaking of that fuel economy, it's not great, but it's not as bad as some people say. Now, the bike around town in the city riding is probably a good 10 miles per gallon less than the old bike, which is surprising. I know it's a V4, but the power output's not much different than the old bike. To have that dramatically worse mileage around town, that's kind of surprising. I think that has to do more with the gearing of the bike itself, which doesn't have any overdrive gears and really makes the acceleration that much better. That said, I'm averaging around town about 33 to 35 miles per gallon. That's my normal. I don't get much more than that no matter how nicely I'm riding it as long as it's stop and go sort of traffic. Once we do highway, I'll tell you the trip that I did to take this to, back to the dealership for its initial service, the same trip I did on the old Multistrada where I used an entire tank of gas and averaged right over 38, almost 39 miles per gallon, did the exact same route on this bike, same speeds, same conditions, and this bike did 38, almost 39 miles per gallon. So highway range is really about the same. Didn't really notice much different at all with this bike, still made it the same distance, had 
not quite a gallon left in reserve. I think it's a safe bet that this bike will do 200 miles in a tank reliably, no matter what you're doing, highway touring sort of thing. Stop and go riding, however, is a little bit different. So what do I think about this bike overall? Is it worth switching from the old Multistrada to the new one? Is it worth the price? What is my final verdict? So again, with almost a thousand miles on the bike and about a month of ownership, this is my takeaway. This bike is absolutely fantastic. It's not without issue, as most new products are the first year or two. It's definitely gonna be some little issues, but the warranty is there to cover it. The technology and the bike itself, the frame geometry, very good. The engine and the power is amazing on this bike. The quick shifter and all the rider aids, the radar cruise control, the blind spot monitoring, the screen mirroring and dashboard configuration, hill hold control, heated seats, heated grips, all of those things this bike comes with really work well. It's a well put together package. I'm very impressed. The wind protection on this bike is amazing. The heat control on this bike, all the things that they've done, all the fins, louvers, vents, all that stuff, really do work well to, to keep the hot airflow away from the rider and put cool air towards the rider. And that's something that I think was way overlooked on the last bike. The rear bags are actually on the slider mechanism, including the top case, to prevent wind buffeting from actually throwing you around while riding the bike. All in all, very impressed with the package Ducati has come out with here. As for the upgrades I've made to the bike, I did order a couple accessories with this bike and have most of them installed at this point. These are things that I pretty much wanted on my last bike. Some of the issues I had in the seven years I've owned that bike, some of the little things that bothered me are things I've taken care of on this bike now with these accessories, but here's what I did. The light array from this bike is great. The old LED array I had, I loved, and they've only improved upon it on this bike. I did go ahead and order the factory fog lights that are made to work with or without the crash bars. They're kind of a new design, but they work with the buttons of the bike. So it's all wired into the bike. The bike knows about them. Provides usable extra light downrange. I do like that, the light output from them. But more than that, it provides a little extra visibility from the front that I think we got rid of when we went to this black beak. So all in all, I think that was a worthy upgrade and well worth the price as far as they're concerned. Moving on, I did order the new hand guards for this bike. As you guys know, we're still in pandemic times, everything happening in Europe, there are delays and things are back ordered. I'm still waiting on the upgraded aluminum touring hand guards to come in. Hopefully they'll be in by the end of the month before my big trip coming up. But that's something I didn't really like on this bike. The old 1200S that had the turn signal built into them, I know were still just plastic, but with the two colors, they looked a little more premium. These look a little cheap on this bike and they kind of flex back and forth. I don't really like that. I did go ahead and order the new ones. They weren't that expensive. I think that's gonna be worth it. Something that I really don't know why Ducati is not doing from the factory at this point, on the last generation L-Twin bike, the 1260, the GT version, it came with an electronic gas cap from the factory. So it always seemed weird that you could have a key fob in your pocket, start the bike, ride the bike, but you still had to pull that key out to get the gas cap off. Likewise, if you don't have your key and you just use the passcode that these bikes have to be able to ride without a key, if you run out of gas, you're now stuck somewhere. You have no ability to refill the gas tank. And that didn't seem like a good idea. I went ahead and ordered and got the new electronic gas cap. The way it works is when you turn the bike off, you have 30 seconds, the gas cap will unlock. So you can go ahead and get gas. Obviously, if you pull into a gas pump, it's great. Turn the bike off. You have 30 seconds to pop that gas cap and you don't need to pull a key out. And I think that's a much needed thing for this bike. It makes it that much more premium and the way it really should be. Speaking of necessary upgrades, I did go back with the three bag setup I had before. These bags are very similar to the old ones as far as size, space, actuation. One thing they've refined a little bit on them is the actual process to take them on and off. It is now easier to take these bags on and off. There's less room for error on them. The old ones really weren't difficult, but you had to know how to take them off. These are pretty easy that just about anybody can do it. And there's very little chance of breaking anything or having anything bind. Like I said, the rear mechanism on these bikes slides, allows the bags to flex a little bit, 
allows them to lean into a corner with you just a little bit and mostly allows that high speed buffeting the bag shaking back and forth to not happen on this bike or for it to not bother the bike at least while riding same thing with this top case it's on this little slider that also allows it to slide back and forth just a little bit without concern of it shaking the bike finally on the rear of the bike i did just a few little upgrades I went ahead and got some reflective tape. It bubbled up a little bit on me, so I'll probably end up doing a different design or find a different way to apply it. But I put three strips of it on the bike to kind of give me an outline. That way vehicles from behind kind of recognize there's a motorcycle in front of them. I think that's a very important safety feature to have. I've also went ahead and done these, some of these sequential turn signals. I really didn't have a problem with the ones that were on the bike. They had decent surface area and they were very bright LED turn signals. They're pretty good. These really just add a little bit of extra style to the bike. And for the price point, I think we're probably worth it. When activated, they scan out from the center and look pretty cool in my opinion. One of the final things I did on the bike was add one of these lights to the back like I had on my old bike. Now, the reflectors on this bike seem to be better made than my old one. They have metal studs, so I don't think they're going to just break off like the old ones did. So I won't have to replace all of them. But on the bottom of the bike, I did like having that little extra brake light on my last bike. I tried wiring it into the brake light of this bike, went ahead, got it all done, and realized whenever I'd activate the brakes, the light would come on, both the factory brake light and the auxiliary light would come on for about half a second. They would then turn off and an air light would appear on the dash. It appears this bike really does pay attention to the voltage of this light. Reading the manual, I know that if you do heavy braking with this bike, the brake light will actually pulse on it. So I think this bike has a little bit greater control and tolerances over that brake light that wouldn't allow this auxiliary light to work. What I ended up doing is just setting it to running light mode. These lights have different patterns that you can cycle through. One of them is a low power running light. I think it's 10% brightness running light mode. I just wired that directly to the license plate light. That gives me just a little bit of positive light output from the bottom of the bike in addition to the factory light up atop just to give me that much more visibility and hopefully not get run over. As I mentioned in my last video guys, one of the issues I'm having with this bike is with the EVAP system I believe. When the bike is hot or in hot weather, every time you open the gas cap, there's pressurized air that comes out that's not supposed to happen. One time even threw gas up at me. So that's kind of concerning. And it goes so far as, especially when you're riding all day and it's been really hot, when we have those 80 degree days here so far in North Carolina. Yeah. When we've had those 80 degree days here in North Carolina and been riding all day, the bike will, when idling and shuts down to two cylinders, has actually stalled on me. When trying to re-engage the bike to take off from a light, the rear cylinders wouldn't reactivate and be very low power. When the bike is hot and you're trying to hold RPMs, you know, mid rev range, 3,000, 4,000 RPMs, the tack would just sit there and flutter and the bike would kind of jerk back and forth, which is not ideal, obviously, and I think an issue with the bike. I've taken it in twice now to have that looked at. The first time is when I was having the new gas cap installed and they didn't see any kinked hoses and just went with installing the new gas cap, hoping that would fix the problem. It didn't, went back, and they're now talking to Ducati North America, thinking they're probably going to be replacing the charcoal canister. Evidently it has some valves in it and has the potential maybe it got clogged somehow. So they're going to go ahead and do that and hopefully see if that solves the problem. I'm hoping it will. Evidently you can't just rip that system out of these bikes because they throw error codes. They're too smart for their own good. I'll link a channel up above here, Rembo USMC has a 2021 Multistrada that he's done a lot of miles on and has a lot of videos on. You guys may have seen his. He's had some issues recently where he's gone to Daytona for the Daytona 200 race. He paid for the full Ducati package down at that Daytona race, including a fan lap around the track. Thought it'd be really cool. He woke up in the morning to go and his bike would not start. Obviously, I don't have to tell you guys why that's an issue and worrying about being able to ride your bike and especially as transportation, really kind of concerning. And mine showing the same signs worries me a bit. But the one thing that I can say that's kind of a relief is that this is not a unique, this is not a unique problem to me. 
that's one thing I spoke with him about just a little bit in his comments is that it seems like there's more than just one or two of these bikes having this issue. It seems like a pretty common thing, which means hopefully there's enough different data points and enough, you know, possible failure issues that Ducati is paying attention and will have a fix for. And that does give me a little bit of hope. All in all, this bike so far, that's really the only issue I've had with it. It's been pretty great. And I think for the price point, the stuff you're getting, the technology, the R&D, all the electronics, man, it's hard to beat this package. If any of you guys have had these issues, let me know. If any of you guys have any other issues with your Multistrada, I'd love to hear about it. For me, I think the upgrade is well worth it. I'm very happy with it. I think it was a good decision and I think it was a worthy upgrade. As I've made note, I'll be doing that long trip down to MotoGP race in Austin, Texas from North Carolina. I think that's gonna be a good test of this bike and I'll definitely bring you guys along to show how well that really works, but I think this bike is gonna do quite well. As always, thanks for watching guys. There's definitely gonna be some more Multistrada content this year. Hopefully you guys are enjoying it. And if you have any comments or suggestions, let me know down in the comments below. Otherwise, appreciate you watching 4K Motoring. We'll be back soon. Yeah.